the bank will have a different relationship with me than I have with, with them. Uh, the third one as well is everything is contextual. So by context, it's like, what is the environment? What am I trying to do? Uh, is it the right time to do so? So I wanna, I wanna just throw this out because this is one of the best definitions I've seen of trust for in quite a while. And so I wanna throw this out just, just to begin with. Now, before we get started with it, I wanna talk about a smaller, it's a bigger topic in a smaller setting, um, which is like why VEX. And th the why of this actually comes down to economics. So uh, e economics at the end of the day, when we tend, one way of thinking of it is this concept of risk and reward. So with risk and reward, like we get up in the morning, we, some of us hop into cars, there's risk there. The reward is that we get to go do things that help us drive more income, get to see friends. So there's a risk and reward for each thing. The same is true if you are attacking a system. There is a risk, uh, there is a reward of like, what is a reward if I break into this thing? Like maybe someone's gonna mine Bitcoin. Maybe somebody is going to try to break into uh, something to extract information out. Maybe there's a reputation uh, part of it that they're looking towards it. There's a risk. What is the risk of being caught? Like, is the risk they lose access to the system? Is the risk that they're going to be contacted by their, uh, by their local law enforcement? So what, what is that penalty? Um, and there's also an opportunity cost. So the opportunity cost is I could spend a week going after a hardened target and when I, maybe I could have made more efforts to go after a, a squishier target and get better results out of it in the long run. So there's also an opportunity cost. Um, even advanced persistent threats, when we say advanced persistent threats, we specifically mean well-funded groups, well-funded criminal organizations or, or governments that have a large quantity of resources, large quantity of people, but even they have limited resources. Any moment they are spending time on going after your organization, or your area, it's time that they could have been spending doing something else, trying to, trying to attack a different, a different target. So even at, even at scale, this ends, up ma this ends up mattering. And time is also a factor for them as well. Like uh, if, if there's a particular event or there's some type of thing that they're trying to do, the, the time necessary to do it uh, may have passed if, the, if they don't move fast enough. So there may be certain effects at the geopolitical side that they may be looking for. And, and so time is also a factor with them. Um, and then we talk about, uh, look at it from the defender side. So as a defender, what is the value of the thing that I'm protecting? So I'm gonna protect a simple video game I make differently from the way I would protect financial information. What is the likeliness of that thing, of that thing being, uh, being attacked? And likeliness here is also a bit interesting as well because it's not just is it likely to be attacked. Of course, all systems are gonna be attacked over time but the likeliness also comes towards what, what is the amount of effort that the attacker is going to put. So this ties it back to the economics from the, from the attacker side. Um, and the defender also ends up looking at things like what is the value, what is the value lost if an incident occurs or if, if the attack is successful. So maybe there's, some, maybe there's a, a particular device and if the device by incident, let's say it's stolen, just as an example. There's the, the value of what was on there. There's the value of the, of the hardware. There are possible penalties if the device is stolen and there were not enough protections on it. So uh, we call this the exposure factor. And finally, what is the cost of protecting the system? So every defense that we take has a cost associated to it. So the cost could be like, what is the cost of encrypting all hard drives? What is the cost of spending the time in order to set up a service mesh, the time to operate and administrate it? And so cost to a defender, often in quantitative analysis, you'll see these type of equations. So um, there's, there tends to be somebody in larger organizations who are using some derivative of these type of, uh, these type of things. So these three I put up just to give you an idea as to what type of things people look for. So single loss expectancy is like some incident occurs, is, uh, let's say it's a break-in or something's lost, then what is the, what is the exposure? So in other words, the, the value of the, of the asset and the exposure factor. Exposure factor is, is, a is a multiplicative thing where you take the value and let's say that you lose 20% of the value if a, if a certain attack occurs. So that means that if you have something that's worth $1,000, attack, the attack is successful, the, val the remainder value or the, the loss at that time is 20%. So your exposure, your exposure factor would be, uh, would be 0.2. So this then feeds into the annualized loss expectancy. So what that is is like, okay, we expect to lose 
500 hard drives over the year. So then you can take all of that and say, well, let's multiply whatever that number was before by 500, and that gets you the, the average loss per year. Interestingly, this also works even if, even if the thing is only happens, let's say, once every 10 years. Like maybe you say once every 10 years we have a flood that damages the data center. Your annual, your annual rate of occurrence at that point is 0.1. So you can, this even works in, in, a long time, uh, in long time scales. The residual value, and this is really the number to watch out for, is what is the cost, what is the value of what is you're protecting? minus the cost of operating and, and, uh, and defending it. Because that remainder value is, is, the, is the total value of the, of the product or of the thing that you're working with or of the data. And the, the reality of it is that if you have a negative residual value, this is actually costing you money. And at that point, you have to ask the question, is, is it worth whatever we're doing? Is it worth doing what we're doing? Or is there a different way we can defend it while still meeting our expectations? So, this residual value becomes very important when you're trying to decide what, I'm, what are we going to defend. So um, a really simple example is what is the cost of log for shell? So if you apply these equations to log for shell, like what is the, the asset value, what is the cost, the cost if that particular thing has been compromised? The annual rate of occurrence, well, how many systems out there do we have to go and repair um, over, over time? What was that cost? The residual cost was like we had that value of whatever it is we were running, that infrastructure, minus the cost of mitigating and defending the log for shell uh, issue. And so we can see that our residual value has dropped as a result of such an attack. So we can see this, this in there. So why this little mini talk before is because anything we do, when we talk about like why are we bringing in S-bombs, why are we bringing in all the variety of things you see here, the economics, the economics matter. And so if we, if we use this concept of qualitative risk and reward, quantitative, trying to determine what the value is, then that helps provide us with some model that we can try to work out what to prioritize. And so the attackers want maximum reward for a minimal risk. So there may be a financial, they may be looking at time, they may be looking at the chances of being caught, What's the penalty being caught? And there's numerous other factors as well, but start to, but start to think about some of this as what, not only in terms of what is the cost of the defender, also think about it, what is the, what is the value that the attacker is going to get out of this, and what is their effort? What is their chance of being caught? Because if you look like a hardened target with limited value, you'll still be attacked, but th there'll be more time spent in, in targets that are, that are higher in value and, and easier to compromise over time. So with that, the main message is do everything you ethically and morally can to shift the economic equations in your favor. So just keep that in mind. So with that, let's talk about VEX. So if we look at some of the newer trends that are coming on, we have software build of materials. So there are a set of claims. Um, when you, just so one little note, when you hear the term claim, you'll hear the term claim quite often, and you'll hear the term attestations. A claim is an, the claim is a noun. I have a claim. I have something that, that, that professes something. An attestation is a verb. So I attest something, generate a claim. So uh, the s of materials is a set of claims that, that will describe who built it, who provided it, what, uh, what is within the particular package, what are the artifacts, when was it created? Where was it created? So there's a whole bunch of things that are within an SBOM that, um, that are included. And so one of the key things, though, as well, is we have these dependencies, and the dependencies of dependencies also mapped out, ideally as, as a set of recursive SBOMs that we can go in and look through. Um, it does off, often it does not include the how. So the how is like, I ran this compiler. These are the steps that I took. These are, the, uh, these, are the, these are the ways I included these particular artifacts. Those matter as well, but very often you have to bring in something else like in Toto to, to deal with it. So generally, software real material gives you a, a, a good picture of what's in something, but is, is, not the, is not the full story. So there's a modeling gap here. The modeling gap is that SBOMs are static. You produce them at build time, generally, or shortly afterwards. And vulnerabilities tend to be dynamic. We discover them over time. So this means that there are, there are some people who think, oh, why don't we stick the CVEs in the SBOM? A better approach instead is we, we, we keep the SBOM. That SBOM becomes a key 
to your CVE database. So you're able to then check, okay, well, I have this, I have this version of log4j keyed against these vulnerabilities. I was able to see, I can get a sense as to, as to where things are. But this, this does leave us with a, with a modeling gap that's there. And so there is a major effort going on throughout multiple companies and has been for a while in order to map uh, versions to CVEs. One of the newer manifestations of this is mapping the actual CVEs or the SBOMs to your, to your CVEs. So literally the SBOM identifier is your key. You extract all the dependencies and then you can recursively check, okay, let's go check each of those as the, with their keys to see, what's, to see what's inside of it. And with that, we, we would expect to be done, but unfortunately we are not. The reason why is that CVEs don't tell the, uh, the whole story. So not everything is affected by its vulnerabilities. Um, and so you, when you spin up a dashboard or you're running a whole bunch of scanners, you often get a whole bunch of different vulnerabilities that you're not affected by. And so this creates, when you're running a large operation, this, this generates a lot of noise. Like how many people, uh, as developers, you run a, a static code scanner or, or something that, that looks for vulnerabilities, and the number of, of red flags that comes up that are false positives, like just makes your development team say, I don't wanna do this anymore. Because at that point, every time that you have these vulnerabilities pop up that are, that are not affecting you, it ends up, it draws your attention. You have to explain to the, to the security team why it's not an issue. You, it ends up, it ends up uh, creating issues where maybe there is a real vulnerability there, but there's so many other things there that, you, that you, you're not gonna, even if you spend the time to try to find it, there's a good chance you might miss it. So now think about this, and now imagine you're running an organization that has thousands of applications, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of workloads and spread across multiple, multiple locations. Now you're talking about a problem that at scale is incredibly expensive and the, C, and the CVE noise that you have there ends up limiting the total value that you, that you have there and you have to make much broader uh, approaches in terms of how to mitigate them. One of my favorite examples is uh, libcurl. So libcurl is a library you can use to, as a client to connect to all sorts of different things. Most people know of it as an HTTP client but it turn, turns out you can also support other protocols like TFTP. There was a bug in TFTP that was thought to be fixed. Turns out it wasn't fixed. And what it did is if you connected it using an SSL certificate, it would leak out some information that would allow for decryption of whatever that material is. And I believe a compromise of the actual private key itself, I believe was part of it. This only occurred if you were using TFTP. So very few people use TFTP, so if you were not using that, then you were in good shape. You run a scanner on top of it though, you're gonna get a message saying, hey, you have this really high level CVE, I think it was like a 9.0 or something at that level, uh, out of 10, that uh, you need to go and resolve. So of course, your teams are gonna come back and say you have, to, you have to patch this because they have no way to tell whether or not you're vulnerable. They can, you, you can have a conversation with them, but, but from their scanning perspectives, they're, they're not able to tell. And so most applications though were not affected even though they were vulnerable because they did not use TFTP. So we have to work around the gap. Today the way we work around those gaps is we often create policies that say whenever a CVE over a certain number is there, we have to upgrade it, no, no questions asked. Um, this ends up increasing the total cost of ownership, also includes risk because whenever you upgrade something, there is a risk that you might end up with something failing. There's a risk that you might have something misconfigured. And so, um, so there is additional cost and risk that's, that's attached there. Um, you may end up uh, hopping onto your vendor and saying, hey, is this thing affected or is it not affected? Maybe you go look for, for a blog post. Um, you may have a vendor representative that you go and discuss, like literally hop onto the phones and say, hey, are we affected by log4j? Yes or no? And uh, having been on the conversation for some of these, I've, I've seen multiple answers that were like, no, we're not affected because we shut that off or because uh, the library was brought in, but we never spin it up, we never use it. Um, so, but when you do the scan, it's there, you can see it. Um, there's also issues around um, how do you, you can also look at mitigating it. So mitigating, say, well, let's stick something in front of it that'll scan for these type of attacks or um, or you may end up accepting the risk, saying, you know what, we know it's there, but, but we're gonna operate anyway because we've, we've analyzed, we're gonna accept the risk. Uh, you eliminate it by saying, hey, 
we're just going to get rid of the product. Like the product's too troublesome or it's not generating enough. The residual value is now negative, not worth running anymore, and we don't have any obligations to, keep, to continue running it. So sometimes you may see, uh, see it eliminated over time. Um, there's also another one which is a little bit, uh, a little bit weird, which is you can transfer the risk. Um, it turns out with ransomware, there's a whole bunch of companies that uh, say, oh, we're covered for ransomware. Oh, great, how did you, how did you mitigate it? Oh, we, we got an insurance policy, we'll pay out. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is terrible. <laughs> um, there's actually a couple things that if, I don't know if they passed or not, but there were some discussions by some, uh, by some governments uh, that if they were to declare ransomware attacks to be a terrorist attack, then at that point, the, the uh, insurance companies that deal in that space would not be able to pay out for ransomware. So they'd be able to cover other things, like a hard drive was lost or something like that, and then help you recoup getting another hard drive. But in terms of uh, ransomware attacks, the, it, it's possible that if it's not already, there's a good chance that we may actually see that particular one go away, at least, at least in the transfer of risk. Um, and so, with that, we have all these ways of like we're trying to work around it that are unique to every organization. Um, and so there's a couple groups that got together in order to create this program called VEX. And so right now, VEX is a draft in the new OASIS CSAF 2.0 standard. Um, there's a couple implementations of VEX that don't follow the CSAF example, but they provide the same structure, the same piece of information. And it's designed for one thing. It's designed to provide a common way to tell from a machine readable perspective, am I vulnerable, not only am I vulnerable, but specifically, am I affected by a specific vulnerability? So every VEX document has, at the minimum, there's a little, little bit more than this, but at the minimum it has these things. It'll have a product tree, which lists all of the products that have been referenced by that document. The affected status, is it fixed? Is it known, is it known to be affected? Is it known to not be affected by it, like the TFTP lib curl thing when you don't use TFTP? Or is it under, currently under investigation? Um, part of it as well is there is there's a gap here where the CVE has to link to some ID, which could be a CVE or might be a bug ID. Um, and so if you have one of those, you're good. But if you don't, then you have to have some way of eventually binding it. So that's one, one little nuance with it. Uh, but one of the neat things about it, though, is that there's also information where you, you can describe how to resolve it. So the, the way you resolve might say, upgrade to this version. Or it might say, to, to mitigate using these steps. You know, follow these three steps, disable this in the configuration, and then you will no longer be affected. Um, and there'll also be notes qu quite often about the details of it. So this is designed to be, to be machine readable with a workflow that looks something like this. You have a, you have a deployed application. You have an SBOM or a set of SBOMs that describe your application. Let's say the new CVE comes out, um, and so now the CVE is popped up in your dashboard. Best case, so best case scenario, you have analysis. You're able to work out that the CVE is there. So you need to determine how are you going to how are you going to work with this particular system. If you don't have VEX, you have to assume you're affected. You have to force an upgrade, or you have to go find more information through other through other channels. With VEX, the team can look up a VEX document. If no VEX statement exists, then uh, my preferred uh, approach is going to be to ask the vendors, hey, can you please publish something? Because if they publish it, then that's not just me that receives the information, it's everyone who's on the product who receives it, so it helps with that. But uh, let's assume that they've, they've issued a VEX statement out. That VEX statement can then be ingested into the cybersecurity dashboards of the various InfoSec teams which that initial flag turned on because of the, the CV being there. And then if it's, if it's affected, it stays on. And we can say, hey, we, this has been, the vendor has stated. Or we can shut it off and say, hey, the, the, the vendor has, even though we see it there, we sit still in our report, our vendor has given us assurances that we're, that we're in good shape, which means you get to focus your attention on the areas where you actually have vulnerability or where you have a lack of information. So in short, SBOMs tell you what's in your infrastructure. CVEs tell you what vulnerabilities are in your infrastructure. And VEX tells you which of those vulnerabilities you're affected by. So this is the, the one, the uh, three-liner, we'll say. <laughs> See a couple of people taking photos, so I'll give it a, give it a brief moment. So there are a couple gaps. 
The first, the first gap is that, so VEX is a claim as to whether a software product is given by a vulnerability. So the, fir so the first part is, do you trust the person or the organization who is putting together the statement? Because I could put together a VEX statement about your product and say, I believe it has this problem or does not have this problem. So you want to look at who's generating it, uh, who's generating that information. So um, in general, vendors will probably be considered to be high, uh, higher quality. You may also have, over time, you might find that certain vendors might be a little bit more flaky. So given enough, given enough time, we may be able to pick up some information. Uh, flaky is the wrong word. We'll say inaccurate because of the complexity of the products. Um, and so, so over time, we'll be able to tell what, from a percentage perspective, given the long enough time horizon, what is the likeliness, what is the accuracy of those, of those statements. So that's still, that's still an open question. But generally, it's going to be much better than what we had before. Um, VEX does not also provide a way to normalize the vendor and product information. Uh, by that, it's like you pull in a product, there's, there might be, uh, let's say you pull in Kubernetes. How many different ways are there to say, I use Kubernetes? and to version that information within the, within the SBOM. So there's, there's some issues around uh, version normalization that needs to occur. And finally, if there's, no, if there's a vulnerability with no CVE or common bug ID that you can point to, like a GitHub issue or, or Bugzilla or so on, then there's, there, it is a required element to have that in there. So you, we, may, we may have to put something in there, just say, hey, we have an internal database or there's something there that we can bind against. So with that, I want to thank you for, for your time. And I'll be around uh, shortly afterwards. But are, are we able to take questions as well? We, we still have a little bit of time. So are there any questions that people have? So I see one, and then there's a second one back there. Can we have the microphone on, please? Can you hear me? OK. The question is about uh, SBOM. So it's it always problematic to, uh, let me say, force the developers to embrace the SBOM in a um, manual way. So there are some automated way language independent to generate this kind of artifact. Because otherwise, uh, this is a, a beautiful approach to manage uh, this kind of uh, security problem. But without give some tools to the developers, it's very hard to implement it. Yeah. That's, that's, a good, that's a good question. So let me make sure I paraphrase it just to be that I have a problem. So you're, you're worried about the SBOM itself, that they're not standardized. There might be different reporting standards, different versions or names and, and ways that people put it together. So what was the last one? And also the automation of, of the generation of this kind of artifact. Uh, yes, and, and the generation of it as well. Different tools put out different things. So th this is a problem. Uh, SBOMs are a relatively new thing. So we're still, we're still in a phase of learning how to generate them properly and with enough information. Um, I think that there's a few things that are going to happen over time. So um, the first one is the commercial products. Those ones will be a little bit easier because in time, the companies will say, these are the type of things we're looking for. I think we'll see uh, forces, the economic forces will normalize some of those over, over time. Uh, one of the problems that we do see, and let me go ahead and shut this off because there's a, a graphic on it, so I'll put it here. So one of the problems that we have is that if you're running an open source uh, community, we're already starting to see people reach out saying, you're, you're an open source vendor who's provided me with this thing. You have to provide this SBOM. And it's like you're telling an open source that they have to uh, maintain or they have to do something when they're not paying them for it. They're not, there's no business relationship there is really weird. And so uh, a couple ways to go about this in order to help is for the larger projects, we have think projects are in the CNCF and so on. We're trying to set up through the tag security and other similar groups to try to work out what's proper guidance to help the developers in that area. But if it's something that's important to you, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of ways that we're starting to see this handle. So the first one is that uh, some of the companies are starting to reach out to open source companies and say, hey, we'll provide um, financial means or we'll provide people to help make this happen, make sure that automation occurs. Uh, another thing that, another pattern we're starting to see happen as well is that if a company ingests a open source project, uh, even if there's no SBOM there, they'll, it's like when you cite your sources. We'll say, uh, this came from this person at this particular time, with, and we've signed the, we've, we've countersigned it just so that we say it's, that that's when it was. So, and here's the scan that we did on top of it. So there's some use for scanning, uh, for the scanning style SBOMs rather than the build time SBOMs that we're going to see used in this as well. Not as high quality of information, unfortunately, because you lose information during the build time. 
but, uh, but those are some of the patterns that we're seeing in order to, to help there. And then over time, I, we'll see where things progress as, as the industry matures. So th does that answer the question? Perfect, and there was another one back there. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering how available is VEX documents today, and is there some kind of um, catalog where we can find existing VEX documents too easily ingest this kind of data? That's a great question. So this is this is very new. Like as in, this is all stuff that's been developing in the past. Um, uh, we'll say six months or so. So there's not a, there's not a very good repository yet for these type of VEX statements to be to be created. That is something that I think as an industry, uh, it's actually a gap that I'm I'm hoping that over time perhaps uh, the open source uh, open source software found uh, software security foundation uh, open SSF might be able to help with or. Uh, perhaps the CNCF maybe will help in some of these areas, but that is a major that is a major gap. Um, over and it also depends on over time. Uh, we'll see where some of this ends up as well. But we, we're starting to see some of the VEX information start to appear not only in open, uh, not only in the CSAF uh, Oasis project, but we're also starting to see like Cyclone BX has their own version of the of the same information that's attached there as well uh, under the VEX name uh, as well. So I th so in time. Right now, it's it's very it's very new, so this is not something that you could go and say implement today, but it's something to keep in mind if you're a vendor, if you're in if you're in charge of this kind of stuff, or if you're on the consumer side, to be able to say, hey, we're really interested in this uh, because it helps reduce the total cost of ownership and helps and helps you focus and get and shifts the it's just the needle on the economics on where on where to spend your your time. So anything that that helps in that direction, I I'm hoping. We'll, we'll see some engagement towards this. So right now it's very new. I, I, we're, seeing a lot of, uh, we're seeing a lot of interest in this. Uh, interestingly, the, lar the largest group that is interested in this stuff is the US government. So uh, if they manage to put it inside of their, uh, if, or if they decide to put it inside of their FedRAMP or one of their other similar programs, and then at that point we should see massive adoption throughout at least the pri major portions of the private sector, and then hopefully those tools will evolve and mature, and then a best case scenario, they'll, they'll be easy to use dashboards or easy ways to generate these documents uh, in, in ways that don't cost developers much. Because again, we talk about the economics. What is the economics of the developer? If it's expensive to the developer, they're probably not going to want to do it or be able to do it uh, because, it, because of the expense. And so, we have, we have to keep it. We do have to keep an eye on on those type of properties, not only for VEX, but also the creation of S bombs. So, uh, I think there's one here, and then at that point we'll we'll be at time. And thank you very much for helping. Um, I feel what VEX is trying to do is sometimes done through CVEs. So you would have, for example, Log for Shell that has a CVE number. But you would also have vendors, uh, you know, like products that consume log for shell, uh, log for j sorry, that also have a CVE associated, like, you know, to like report that they're vulnerable to it. Um, so, how do you how do you think about like we could we could manage this situation and avoid having, you know, multiple CVEs for one root, uh, you know, vulnerability uh, for all the products that consume that dependency. Yeah, that's a good question. And so the, the problem that we ran into with CVEs, there's two problems. So the first CVEs, if you've ever tried to parse the CVE from, from the MITRE group, uh, it's possible to parse it, but it was really made for, for presenting to humans. So that's the first problem we run into. The second problem that we run into is, so if it's a one-to-one -one product, like you have a vendor that says, hey, our product uh, over here has this problem, or a small number of vendors, and then you're in okay shape. But what ends up happening is when you get something like Log4j, the quantity of products that are affected by it are so high that that CVE, if you were to list every single product that's inside of it, that CVE is going to be like massive and will be useless to, to people. So being able to create the VEX document that links that CVE and says whether they're affected or, or not um, helps. And usually what they do is they, there's a number called a CPE. So they usually look at the CPE number and then look at the, the version there and then match that to the vulnerability. But that says the vulnerability is there, but doesn't tell you whether or not that particular product is affected or not. So your scanners will say, yes, this is there. Uh, then you have to assume you're affected. And so VEX will provide additional context 
that will that will help determine whether whether or not it's affected or not with information coming from the vendor or or a trusted source. So hopefully, th does that help answer the the question? It was more about duplicate CVEs. So like instead of having a CPE that says, okay, this product is also affected by that CVE, sometimes you would see another CVE created. Um, oh yes. You know, so like. Yeah, hopefully we re reduce that because that's also noisy. Like. If you can have one CVE and then you're able to say these are all the products that are affected by it, is a much better than saying here are the 10 CVEs that all map to the same to the same thing. So thank thank you for highlighting that. That that is something that I think Vex will will definitely help with. Um, so I want to thank you for your time and also thank Tiffany for for helping with this as well. So thank you.